All right, thank you guys. I am uh, feel a little bit sorry for the rest of you at home. It is such a, a joy and a blessing to get to be here and to get to sing with others and be kind of in the room as Carrie and these guys lead. And that uh, fills and warms my heart. I, I don't know about you guys, but I've reached the point in this whole COVID-19 shutdown thing where I'm kind of tired of it. And it's, it's almost becoming uh, potentially discouraging to not get to be with you, to not get to share in the Lord's Supper together, to not get a chance to see one another face to face. We we miss being together, uh, but this is a lesser good, but it's still a good, and I hope that you are encouraged today, and I hope that you uh, will, will be encouraged to really put your focus on the Lord today. He is our salvation. Uh, the Lord God we serve is sovereign. He reigns over all. He's immortal and invisible, the only God, and we can trust him. We can rest in his love. We can rest in his grace, and so let's turn our hearts to him in prayer today this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love to us. We thank you that uh, no matter what happens, we know we can look to you, and you will carry us through whatever difficulties may come. You are sovereign. You know the future, even though we don't. So Lord, strengthen our faith today. Humble us and encourage us with your word. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles this morning to James chapter 4. James chapter 4 will be in verses 13 through 17 this morning. James chapter 4. We have a a problem, many of us. The church today in the United States has a problem. And the problem is that atheism is alive and well in the body of Christ. I'm sure that very few of you who are watching today would outright deny the existence of God. Very few of you would would renounce God and say he doesn't exist with your words. But unfortunately, many people today in the church go through life as if God doesn't exist. He is very rarely in their thoughts, very rarely in their desires or their plans. They don't acknowledge him or his will in day-to-day life. And this problem This problem of a sort of practical atheism is not new. In fact, it's always been a problem. It's a human problem. And James tackles this issue head on in James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Let's read the text together. James chapter 4, verse 13 says this. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know that tomorrow, what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Throughout this letter that James writes, we've seen over and over again that genuine faith, real faith, should affect every part of our lives. If you're a true believer, this faith will leave no corner of your heart untouched. And this extends, James says, even to the ways that we make plans, even to our goals and our, uh, the, the way we, we plan to get things done in the future. The very simple point of this straightforward text this morning is that true faith humbly embraces the sovereign will of God. That's a mark of genuine faith, is that it genuinely, humbly embraces the sovereign will of God. Now, as always, I want to make sure that we understand the terminology James is using, that we understand these words. When James refers to God's will in this text, when he says, if the Lord wills, He is not talking about God's moral will. God's moral will is clearly revealed in his laws, the things that God wants you to do, the commands towards holiness and obedience and worship. I mean, those are things that are very clear. We know God's will, and we could survey myriad texts where it makes that very clear. Um, This moral will is made clear in Scripture. But that's not what James is referring to. It's not the moral will of God that he's talking about here. James is referring instead to what we call the secret will of God. It's God's plan for the future, for tomorrow, 
and next month and next year if Christ tarries. And unlike God's moral will, which we find very clearly spelled out in Scripture, God's secret will is usually not revealed to us. We are not offered access to God's secret will. We're never commanded to try to figure it out. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29 says this, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. That would be God's secret will. There's certain things we don't get to know. But, Moses writes, the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. This text captures for us the moral will, the things that are revealed for us to obey and do, and God's secret will, those things that belong to God, and we don't have access to them. Here in James chapter 4, when James refers to the will of God, he's talking about that secret will of God, God's plan for the future that is unknown and unknowable to us until we experience it. But that secret will of God is fully known to him. It's been known by him since eternity past because he is totally and absolutely sovereign. God is sovereign. Now, maybe you're watching this this morning and you are new to the Christian faith, or perhaps you're not a believer in Christ yet, and this word sovereign is a theological word that maybe you've heard thrown around, but what does it mean to be sovereign? The sovereignty of God can be described as his complete control in determining and directing and ruling over all things. That's what it means to be sovereign. Really, that's what it means to be God. That's what it means to be God. For us to resent or to reject God's sovereignty is really rejecting God's right to be God, to direct and to determine and to rule over all things that he has created. James here intends to remind us that nothing happens outside of God's will. And this is the testimony of scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. That's what it means to be sovereign. Psalm 135 verse 6 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the deeps. Psalm 139 verse 16 says, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. We could go on. Daniel chapter 4 verse 35 It says, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? God is sovereign. That's the lesson that King Nebuchadnezzar learned the hard way. We see it in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Paul writes that he works all things according to the counsel of his will. And we could go on and on and on. This is just scratching the surface because we find this truth on every page of Scripture. The reality of God's sovereignty is on display in every story. It's in every song. It's in every parable. It's in every sermon that we find on the pages of God's holy and inspired word. God is the supreme sovereign over all the universe. And we are not. We don't know how many people will die of the COVID-19 virus. We don't even know how many people have the, the virus. We don't know how big the impact is going to be economically. We don't know who's going to lose their jobs. We don't know what the political landscape will look like after all of this. We don't know. And it is good that we be reminded of that, that we don't know what the future holds. We cannot know or control any of those things, but we know that God can. And God does. God is sovereign and nothing happens outside of his plan. You might say, okay, so what? What does that mean for me? Well, the truth of God's sovereignty, this truth that James refers to here in this text, it calls not only for for agreement. This is not just an invitation for some cold intellectual commitment to some truth that's somewhat abstract. No, this calls for warm-hearted faith. It calls for faith, not just for understanding, but this truth calls for our submission. As Christians, we are called to trust that this sovereign God is also a good God. As chapter one says, he's the giver of every good and perfect gift. 
And he does everything for our good and for his glory. And this, to embrace this and to submit to this, this is faith. It's faith in the goodness of God and in the sovereignty of God that should cause us to humbly embrace his sovereignty each and every day of our lives. Now, what James does is simply apply this truth. He takes this theology, this doctrinal truth, and applies it to our lives. And he tells us it's important to embrace this idea of God's sovereignty for several reasons. And I'd like to share three of those with you this morning. First of all, we must embrace the sovereignty of God because forgetting that God is sovereign, forgetting his sovereignty is foolish. It's foolish. Look in verse 13 through 15. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. This phrase, come now, that that James starts this section with, he's being very abrupt. This is very direct and serious. He says, listen, you need to listen up and pay attention because this is very, very important. James wants to talk to us about the issue of godless planning. You see, like many of us, perhaps, his readers were deliberate and they were, they were organized and they were confident planners and they were very sure of their outcome. They say, we will make a profit in verse 13. But there's a problem. The problem here is that there's no mention of God in their plans. There is no awareness of his control over all things, including them and their business ventures. There's no acknowledgement here of God's will for their lives. It's not necessarily their goals that James condemns. He doesn't have a problem with business plans, but it's rather the godless way that they are pursuing those goals. That's what James intends to confront. And notice that he doesn't call them brothers here. If you've been with us through this series in James, we've noticed that again and again and again, James regularly addresses his readers as my brothers. But he doesn't call them brothers here because honestly, they're not acting like it. This attitude of theirs smells of unbelief, not of faith. This godless mindset is all too common in our culture today. And sadly, it can even infect the church. You've heard it before. You've seen the motivational posts. Reach for the stars. If you can dream it, you can do it. Believe in yourself. The sky is the limit. If you work hard and put your time in, you can do whatever you set your heart to do. And there are some so-called preachers who even distort the gospel to be some sort of design source of power so that you can reach your personal goals. Peddling a prosperity gospel that makes faith just a sort of means to your own personal ends. But where is God in all of this? What place does he have? Planning and ambition can be good things, but going about these things in a way that leaves God out is simply foolish. It's foolish. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. There are two reasons why it's foolish to forget God in the midst of your planning. We see both of these in verses 14. First of all, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And secondly, your life is short. If being sovereign is what it means to be God, then James reminds us that being finite is part of what it means to be human. Our knowledge is finite. There's limits to what we can see and know. And our lives are finite. They end. And we don't know when. It could be in 20 minutes It could be in 20 years. It is only if the Lord wills that we will live and do this or do that, verse 15 tells us. James asks us a penetrating question, as he often does. He says, what is your life? What is your life? Just like he asked in the previous section, who are you to judge? These questions are intended to remind us that God is God and we are not. We are creaturely. We are human. James here takes up a metaphor, a descriptive one that's found in Job and in Psalms and on the lips of Isaiah that we are like a mist that vanishes, like a breath of air on a cold morning. We're here for one moment and we're gone the next. God is the supreme and eternal sovereign. We are a mist. That's who we are. Listen, no matter how smart you are, no matter how driven and capable you are, 
No matter how much research you do, no matter how much education you have, no matter how much grit and guts you have, you really don't know for certain what's going to happen tomorrow. And you can't control the outcome. Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21, shows us the folly of planning without God, of banking on tomorrow and putting our faith in our plans and in our possessions. Jesus tells a story. He told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? Jesus interprets this parable for us and says, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Considering our inability to see the future and the shortness of our lives, it is really foolish to forget God's sovereignty and fail to factor it into our planning. Notice how James says that we should go about planning. He doesn't say that we should chuck all of planning out the window because God is sovereign and we don't know. That's not necessarily the application. Look in verse 15. Here's how we should plan. He says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, We will live and do this or that. That's what real faith looks like. True faith will humbly acknowledge the sovereign will of God, recognizing that while we don't know what will happen tomorrow, he does. And because he has planned it, it will come to pass. Our future is shaped by the contours of his sovereign will. But let me just encourage you with this. This reality of God's sovereignty calls not just for our acknowledgement. It calls also for our submission. As Christians, we are to trust that God's will is not just going to happen, but that his will is better than our will. And that's the challenge. That's the challenge for many of us today. As Christians, we're called to trust his will is better and we are to humbly submit our will to his, to seek to align our will with God's will. Jesus taught his disciples how to pray in Matthew 6. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If Jesus instructs us to pray for God's will to be done, then then it follows that our desires should be aligned that way. That's what we should want. That's what we should be asking God to do, trusting that his will is best. To say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. That's not just shrugging your shoulders because, oh, well, God's in control. It's really out of my hands. No, it's rather a declaration of faith. It's an acknowledgement of God's sovereign plan and a statement of trust in God's purposes. True faith embraces the sovereignty of God. And ignoring God's sovereign will, James says, is foolish. It's foolish because we don't know what tomorrow brings And we don't even know how long our lives will last. But there's a second reason why why we should be careful to acknowledge God's sovereignty, embrace it. Secondly, ignoring God's sovereignty is arrogant. It's not just foolish, James says. It's arrogant. Look in verse 16. He says, as it is, if you're making plans the way that verse 13 says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Again, James is always eager to not just condemn certain behaviors, but to diagnose the heart. And the kind of heart that makes these plans and says these words is an arrogant heart. The problem with this sort of planning is that it replaces God with self. It's sheer pride. God, ignoring God's sovereign rule over our days and over our lives, that starts happening when we start to think that we are actually in control. James says this is boasting in our arrogance. And it's not just dumb. It's evil. It's evil. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. This echoes very clearly 
the same logic that James used in the previous section about slander and rendering judgment on others. When we start thinking that we are the judge, we need to repent of our pride. James says, who are you to judge your neighbor? And when we start thinking that we're in control of our lives, we need to be humbled again. James says, what is your life? James gives us a little help here to grow in humility by reminding us of our place. And again, this is about far more than just business planning. He says in verse 16, look at it, all such boasting is evil. It's not just about business plans. This this applies to all of life. Take note that this underlying heart attitude that James condemns, this kind of arrogant boasting, this pride, it has many different manifestations. Pride has many different species. It's like a virus that can mutate and adapt to our own tendencies, our own desires, into a thousand different varieties. When we ignore God, no matter what kind of boastful behavior it leads to, James says it is evil. It is evil. We've already seen in James that pride follows in Satan's footsteps. Rather than humble Christ-like behavior, pride is to follow the devil. In Isaiah, we read a poetic description of the fall of Lucifer. And it's interesting to note the parallel language between this text and that text. This text has this confident assertion that, we see this in verse 13, that we will do this and this and that. In Isaiah chapter 14, you see the confident assertions, I will, I will. I'll read it for you and just hear the echo of pride. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I will, I will, I will. And ultimately, what's at the end of this proud statement? To be sovereign, to be like the most high, to be in control, to have the glory That is for God and for God alone. And any sort of I will, we will confidence that ignores God is following in those same footsteps of when Satan fell from glory. Be careful not to emulate the devil's proud self-confidence and selfish ambition. Scripture makes it abundantly clear that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So the call for us is to humbly embrace God's sovereignty and guard against that heart-level arrogance that relies on self and trusts on self and is confident in self as opposed to relying on, trusting in, and being confident in God. Ignoring God's sovereign will is foolish and it's arrogant. And then thirdly, disregarding God's sovereignty is sin. It's sin. Look in verse 17. James concludes, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. James takes away any excuses we might have left at this point. He says, now you know, now you've heard, now I've told you, so you are accountable. You are accountable. Disregarding God's sovereignty is sin, black and white. This might seem like strong language to you to say, so if I'm not thinking the right way and sort of you know, planning according to this formula, then I'm in sin, really? Does it really deserve that kind of a label? I think it's good for us to remember that there's two kinds of sin. There are, first of all, sins of commission. Those are things that we do that we're not supposed to do. So the Bible instructs us not to lie. When we deceive, misrepresent the truth, falsify information, That is a sin of commission. We have done something. We have transgressed God's law. So there's sins of commission, things we do, but there's also sins of omission. That's things we should have done but didn't. That's when you have an opportunity to obey God and do something he calls you to do, and you do nothing. Now, we tend to feel pretty good about ourselves if we don't do certain bad things, Right, We can look in scripture and see some of the big ticket items and say, I haven't broken that law, I'm not breaking this law, I'm, I'm obeying this law. But we often sort of soften the description of sins of omission. Maybe it sounds like this, yeah, I really dropped the ball there. Or, wow, that was a missed opportunity, I guess. Um, or, or, I really need to grow in that and do better next time. Or, yeah, I should probably do better there. But we need to recognize what James declares, that when we know the right thing to do and do not do it, James says 
It is sin. This really makes our view of sin a lot bigger, doesn't it? It expands it from just not breaking certain rules to any time we don't do all that God calls us to do. When we know the right thing to do, James says, and fail to do it, it is sin. I've read this before, but I want to share it with you again. It's an extended statement on sin by Pastor John Piper. He says, what is sin? The glory of God not honored. The holiness of God not reverenced. The greatness of God not admired. The power of God not praised. The truth of God not sought. The wisdom of God not esteemed. The beauty of God not treasured. The goodness of God not savored. The faithfulness of God not trusted. The promises of God not relied upon. The commandments of God not obeyed. The justice of God not respected. The wrath of God not feared. The grace of God not cherished. The presence of God not prized. The person of God not loved. That is sin. We need a broader view of sin that includes our nature and our deeds and our failure to act as we should. Because only when we recognize sin for what it is can we then confess it and turn away from it and receive the the cleansing and forgiving grace of God and the power of his spirit to help us to do the things that God commands. James identifies godless planning as foolish. He reveals the heart behind it as arrogant and he condemns it as being sin. But James also prescribes for us here the alternative behavior, the right kind of planning that springs from a different kind of heart. Again, to point you back to to verse 15, James gives a solution. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. Now, this is not just a mere word formula that we're supposed to repeat. There's a lot of those little cliches that Christians can tack on to their conversations or their prayers. You know, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow for lunch, Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. You know, that sort of a thing. It just can get tacked on in an empty sense. But rather what James is calling for here is an attitude of the heart that we are to cultivate, an attitude of dependence, a heart of faith, that joyfully and humbly embraces God's sovereignty over us. God does not want a people who simply honors him with their lips, but whose heart is far from him. So you can say, if the Lord wills, and really not be um, embracing the sovereignty of God the way that scripture calls us to. You see, God wants a changed heart. He wants new attitudes. He wants purified thoughts. He wants righteous desires and holy affections. And the kind of heart God desires in us is one that readily admits, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. And and says those words with a spirit of joyful humility. And this is really harder than it sounds. It's easy to say words. It's hard to have this kind of a heart because we feel that sinful desire, that fearful desire, that selfish desire, that proud desire to be in control. That's often why we plan, because we want certainty. We want knowledge. We think that knowledge is power, and if we can sort of plan out the future, we can calm our fears, and we'll know how to prepare adequately to face anything that may come. But this obsession with the future points to our spiritual need, doesn't it? We all believe that God is in control, but sometimes maybe you don't want him to be in control. You don't want him to be in control if it's going to mean that he ruins your plans, your well-laid plans. We know that God is sovereign, but the trouble is sometimes we don't like it. We secretly wish that our will could be done on earth as it is in heaven. We wish that we could be sovereign, We might not be foolish enough to think we can control our destiny, but maybe you have a hard time rejoicing in the fact that God does control your destiny. He controls your yesterday, your today, and your tomorrow. But James says that our plans are to be submitted to the Lord if the Lord wills. And and this implies, again, not not just good theology, not just proper speech. It requires a surrendered heart. We know that his will is going to come to pass and we embrace it. We say, yes, Lord. Yes, your will 
be done. The fact is, the will of God always plays out. Always. God does what God wants. But listen, if you are a Christian this morning, if you have genuine faith, then that truth that God's will is always brought to pass, that God always does what God wants, this will be good news to you. It will encourage you. It will refresh your spirit. It will strengthen your faith. It will be good news, not a hopeless fatalism. God promises to do all things for his glory and all things for our good. And we can even look to scripture to see examples of how this has already played out. If you want an example of God's will playing out in a way that glorifies him and greatly benefits us, here's the ultimate proof. The ultimate proof is this, that God sovereignly ordained to send his son to take on flesh and to live a perfect life. But at the end of that perfect life, he would be betrayed by one of his closest friends, abandoned by the rest of the disciples, wrongly accused, falsely condemned, unjustly treated and brutally murdered. That was God's will. And the purpose behind that plan was to not only exalt the glory of his son, Jesus Christ, but to give you the eternal life, the forgiveness, the joy, the hope that you could have had no other way. Every turn of history from Adam to Jesus hinged upon that plan, anticipated that event, pointed forward to it, and God sovereignly brought it to pass. It was his will. Acts chapter 2 verse 23 says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. The gospel is the perfect example of God's sovereign will playing out, bringing about injustice and tragedy and suffering even, to accomplish his perfect plan. Isaiah 53 tells us that it pleased the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. It was God's plan from before the foundation of the world. My friends, this is the good and faithful God that we trust, who is sovereign in this way. If his sovereign will brought about our salvation, through the greatest tragedy and injustice that the world has ever seen in the crucifixion of Christ. Don't you think we can trust him with our tomorrow? We need to understand God's love and God's sovereignty, not just in abstract philosophical terms, not just from a cold, rational, analytic perspective. We need to understand the sovereignty of God in the light of the gospel. The cross ought to humble us and lead us to embrace his sovereignty with faith and humility and joy. Let me ask you a question this morning. What are you holding on to when it comes to your future? What is it that your hands refuse to relinquish? What hopes or plans or desires or fears are you having a hard time trusting God with for tomorrow? let me plead with you to lay those down today and to humble yourself before God this morning because this is what real faith, genuine faith looks like. Jesus, as our perfect example, agonized in the garden of Gethsemane the night before his crucifixion. He knew what was coming and he prayed, Lord, if there's any other way, Father, if there's any other way, take this cup from me yet. Not my will, but your will be done. Can you honestly pray that prayer this morning? This is the heart that God desires from us, a heart that knows and believes in and acts in light of God's sovereignty, a heart that has surrendered all ambitions and plans and dreams and desires to his perfect will, a heart that rejoices in the knowledge that God's will is always right It is always good, and it is always perfect. And an arrogant presumption can only exist where there's an absence of faith. Faith rests in the goodness and control of this sovereign God. Genuine faith will be humble because it's looking to someone bigger, someone more powerful, someone more capable, someone more wise, someone who is all-knowing. True faith will embrace the sovereignty of God.
And it's my prayer that you and I would both respond to this text and this truth with that kind of faith this morning. Will you pray with me? Holy Father in heaven, you rule and you reign over all things. God, today we acknowledge this truth. We confess that it is beyond our full comprehension, but yet it is something you call us to believe because it is clearly declared on the pages of Scripture. Lord, increase our faith. I pray that you would humble us today, that you would humble us and keep us from being resentful or critical or or not content with your sovereign will. Lord, give us a deeper and a truer faith that embraces this truth humbly, joyfully, trustingly. Lord, make us willing to, to receive whatever you give and to relinquish whatever you take, to go without whatever you declare we should go without. Make us content and humble before you as the sovereign and good king. Lord, for some who are listening today, who may not know you, and this truth of a sovereign God scares them or even angers them, I pray that today you would bring them to see the goodness of this truth, that you would expose their unbelief, show them that living apart from you, living according to their own sovereign power and will, only will lead to destruction and judgment and loss. God, I pray that you would show them the bright hope of what it really means to trust in you, to trust you with our eternal salvation looking to the cross, to trust you that you will raise us from the dead like you did your son, Jesus Christ, to trust you that your plan for tomorrow is better than our plan, to trust you that you will keep all your promises. Lord, this is the life of faith, and we thank you for the blessing it is to live in the joy and security of faith in your sovereign plan. And Father, we pray that you would bring others to also embrace these truths, to trust in your son, Jesus Christ. God, purify us today. I pray that our church would be humble in the way that we plan. I pray that each one of us individually would be humbled before you. We pray that you'd be glorified as we seek to walk by faith in your sovereign plan. Amen. Amen.